Luca, we appreciate him being here this afternoon. He is going to give a presentation called Race Against the Machine Rapid Exploit Development via LLMs. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we get started, this is my first talk, so we wish you luck. <laughs> um, so, we're going to the framework based on the title of the presentation. Um, the name it says the time to exploit uh, in the 2018 to was. 63 days. From then, it's gone down to uh, 44 days, and now down to 32. Right now, the way we measure the time for an exploit to come from after the uh, announcement of the actual exploit is about a month. We're measuring in months and weeks. And realistically, with the advent of uh, AI and these LOMs, we're looking at minutes and hours fundamentally changes how we have to understand and see and deal with these exploits as they come out. So, hi, a uh, quick disclaimer, nothing I say or do is a reflection of my employer. Uh, all work can take the solely my own. Um, I do actually have a late progress upcoming that is many legal reviews, and for the same reasons, I can't go as far as technical details as I'd like. Um, so, show of hands if you've heard of AI. Okay, good. I hope all of you have, unless you've been living under a rock. Um, really what we're specifically talking about here is LOMs. And LOMs are interesting, because for the longest time, we rely on highly specialized models trained on particular data sets. And with these kind of large language models, now we have a generalized model that we can actually physically tailor or train on content, and it can be able to completely surpass the piece of specialized models. So with that, okay. Um, so, completely lost my way. Not 
necessarily the best. So the question is, how do you train AI? Well, the answer is, tell the truth. Um, here you can see, I'm, I'm telling it to play the role of a higher ethical uh, hacker, slash red teamer, and it answers just fine. But this still causes problems, though, within the context of delivering a full working payload. It will still arrow out, and it will still not give you a full working code. So what you have to do is actually present it with some sort of framework uh, in terms of engagement. And after giving it both a framework, uh, a context for which it exists, and a framework for it to operate in, it actually works with no problem. And then one of the important things here to understand is if you take a step back, this is not only able to understand coding and programming, but it has a working framework where certain things are acceptable and unacceptable. And it shows some sort of approximation of understanding and theory of mind. And the, the greater context for this is today is the worst AI will ever be, and it will only ever get better. Uh, so a little bit talking about the actual research here. Um, the CD we're going to be evaluating this on is CD 2022, 42889, uh, often just called text for shell. Uh, this was a popular Apache vulnerability that resulted in, in a code execution and caused a lot of long nights for some people. Um, the reason why this is chosen was because it's the perfect confluence of circumstances. It's a big critical vulnerability. It was a critical vulnerability that came out after the training date for the model, so it had no awareness or context of this. It's open source and had fairly good documentation. Um, there's actually a pre-existing POC to compare the code that it develops to some sort of baseline. And the actual uh, NIST CD description is, is half decent. It's not devoid of context. And honestly, it was uh, pretty easy to build a Docker relative to some of the other things. Um, so, talking a little bit about the methodology. There's two things to evaluate. One is the level of detail. And that means how much detail are you giving the large language model to understand and interpret? That level of detail essentially comes down to three points. One of them is seeing if you give it the CD description and the full POC, can it come up with anything? Right? That's just getting that baseline assessment of how well can it do when you practically tell it what to do. Um, then, going down, you give it less than here. You take the CDE and you give it the documentation as well. So it has that understanding and framework, but also knows what that vulnerability is. And then taking it to the next step, you take it down to just that CDE. And if it is even humanly possible for with just the CDE to develop an act for working export. Um, and then the idea of iterations. An iteration is essentially how many cycles does it take for it to work and build full working exploit code? Uh, each cycle is essentially a prompting. So the way it works is if we were to have some sort of error or no result, that information would be fed back and that would be the start of the next iteration. So how many of these iterations, one by one by one, does it take? How long does it take? How easy is it? How hard is it? How feasible is it? It's important to understand that because the context we're looking at this is for someone who is not adept at anything related to coding, not adept at cybersecurity, someone with just a baseline knowledge. So, giving it the, uh, both the CDE description and the full POC details, this was the first code that was able to come up. Now, you'll notice I'll point out a couple things, which is that. Uh, it kind of lifted wholesale, wholesale that JavaScript argument where it's adding 195 and 324, and but it actually significantly slimmed down the original code in just this code block. Um, anyone want to guess if this will work? I have to give away a prize. Who says this will work? Who says it won't work? Well, I 
but what? What? Well, well, let's see. It immediately works. <laughs> Who's it well? All right. Yeah, no, it immediately works, because basically you're giving it just the POC information. <laughs> that POC has some semblance of working code in it, and that working code is able to be translated, understood, and is able to boil it down to those core concepts and then actually condense it quite significantly. Um, if you see the warnings on the outputs, that's just incidental. Um, but that's good. It's not, wow, that's amazing. You've literally gained it, the code basically understanding in order to do it. Um, it worked, but it better have it than anything else had a chance. Um, so this is a brand new thread, new uh, code, no previous understanding of the previous uh, thread, having what to do with POC. So this is just giving information from the documentation and the CDE only. Uh, what I will note for this, this round of iterations of the documentation and CDE is that I gave it, it gave a prompt at first that was just a guide of how to do it, but only word-based, and to prompt additionally for actual code block. Uh, and interesting with this one, it didn't generate one script, it generated three separate scripts, basically going through the vulnerability and looking at what core components were vulnerable. Um, here it's testing printing. How many iterations do you think this took? I guess? Three? Who guess? It instantly worked. And that's fantastic. Uh, and a little bit scary. Now, there's three separate scripts, so we have to evaluate do all of them work. So let's look at the next one. The next one is doing basically the same thing, except this is doing an example of DNS. Essentially being able to run code with uh, a for DNS. And, much like the first one, it works first try. And that same story goes forward when we actually evaluate for the whole web page. So with only the description and the documentation of the software, it was able to build a full working exploit. The void of the context of any POC, the void of any idea of what the code should properly look like, just that understanding that something's wrong based on that CDE, and having a working understanding of what the documentation of the software looks like, it was able to build this full working exploit. And it's in one shot. It's not even multiple iterations. We're not talking about going through and coming back and going through and coming back and fighting through the nail. I would take longer to build this. This is really impressive. That being said, not all applications, all pieces of software are open source and not all of them are honestly, they don't have great documentation. And that's um, something that I have to deal with a couple times and it may seem like a security feature in this context, but I promise you it's not. Um, so, that's where this comes in. Just the CD, the CD description only. I would struggle to build four exploits with just the CD description only. I'm sure a lot of people would. All right, how many iterations do you think it'll take? For the next one. One. One? One? Five. Five? I guess I've heard it yet. Three. Three? Three? Four. <laughs> so yeah, it takes four iterations to develop a full working POC code. Let's, let's, so let's look at that step by step. So the first thing it did was output absolutely nothing. So rather, typically the process is to just copy the error output in back into the interpreter. Here, it was just pulled, it was prompted, and it said, nothing outputs. So what's really interesting is that it changes it drastically. This is a much larger code block. You can see that it utilizes a lot of try and catch it. It has some print statements. It tries really hard to put everything out there. It just kind of throws everything in the block. Um, and another big point, and this is something from doing uh, testing with this and trying to work with this exploit prior, it changed this whole string substitute part at the very top. And 
that fix is the difference between it working and not working. Uh, it, and it, it found that without really knowing any information. It changed that. When really the only context it was given was, hey, nothing output. Uh, still, that doesn't work. So what do we do? We take that output and we iterate it. Uh, the reason it doesn't work here is because it tried to name both Java as opposed to JavaScript, actually. So here it does something extremely, extremely surprising. And because I've worked with uh, using the LLMs for building code quite a bit, it cuts a lot of that. This, so this script is significantly shorter than the prior one. And it doesn't normally do this. Um, so I've got a very interesting find. The question is, does it work? <coughs> kind of. You can actually see that it does do the print statement correct. It does get the DNS correct. But it errors out at the last minute. And that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for full working exploit vulnerability. Well, give it one more check. And here you can see it works all the way. Every single part, every single function, everything works. Four, now, we're talking the concept of four iterations. Four iterations doesn't seem like it, it doesn't seem great when compared to the one iteration and the one shot of the previous ones. But that's not bad at all. That's what, 20 minutes? It took me longer to set up my Docker environment to run the testing than it did to generate malicious code. And that's pretty scary because Everything, basically, every new CDE that comes out, especially the critical ones, becomes some sort of zero day for working POC code almost immediately. Though, obviously, you won't have to go back and test for it. But when it comes out, it essentially comes out with a POC code fully made. And that's very easy to utilize. And it's something that someone with very little knowledge can do. Now, carrying out the exploit is another issue. You actually have to deliver the payload, you have to do all that rest of the stuff. Well, that's pretty easy too. You just ask. You ask it to put it in an exploit. This is novel code, but it, not only does this work, it gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to make it work. So you're talking about with just a CD description and 30 minutes, you have a brand new exploit with zero knowledge that you can go deliver in that instance. It's so much more accessible. This is, I mean, it's not something that my, my grandmother could do, but it's something that your average office worker who's disgruntled could spend a weekend doing, and it would take almost no skill. Uh, this essentially gives everyone access to working uh, POC code very quickly. And especially for these large group of vulnerabilities, that's terrifying, because it's no longer these large ADTs or even well-funded cyber criminal groups. It is everyone with access to working POCs within hours, minutes, of when these CDs drop. Um, and there's a lot of implications to this. We can't measure time to exploit in months and weeks anymore. It's minutes and hours. And it's not just these big ADPs who gave access to these POCs and were practically zero days right off the top. This is everything. And it's something that we need to think about how we do it. We need vendors to drop patches more often as, as, far as, the, as soon as the CDE comes out. That's kind of a pipe dream sometimes, but hopefully this will put some pressure on them. Uh, and one of the kind of ironic things is that it might be better to have less descriptive CDEs because those less descriptive CDEs give these threat actors, or just layman, less information to work on. So that's more of a question posed to you, because that obviously comes with the trade-off of not having the information. But the, the point of the matter is that everything needs to be treated like there's working POC code out there. So based on that, here are some couple recommendations of like how to come to terms and deal with this. Obviously, more real-time monitoring defenses. This is more on the uh, preventative side. This is stuff like SOAR. This is stuff like just having good uh, aims on machines that are blocking things. These, this isn't, this is all pretty standard stuff. 
Next, if you've heard it before, patch early, patch often, make sure you patch as soon as possible. The problem is, though, that delta between when CPEs released and the vendor drops uh, the actual patch for the software. And that's, you're just waiting in the open until that happens. And, and that focuses more on remediation. Then we look at focusing on infrastructure resilience, essentially making sure that if you do get breached, you can maintain operations. And that has to do with more network segmentation and network isolation and system isolation. And that all feeds back to the concept of zero trust. But fundamentally, that is just remediation. It's a matter of, it's not a matter of if you'll be hacked or breached, but when. So we have to think about this within broader context uh, and think what this means within our increasingly interconnected cybersecurity world. It's not just script keys and APTs with this tremendous power. It's everyone. And you have to remember, today is the worst AI will ever be for only get that. Uh, and it's normally you won't see it coming. It's, there hasn't been many changes as of late. But those updates are happening last time in the scenes. They're trickling in, which will eventually come to be a recent update. But in the open source side, they're coming in and getting up to the capabilities of these larger language models that are closed source. Um, and it means that a disgruntled employee could wreak habit at a company without the need for permissions to access. They have everything remote, laptop taking away everything, and still have the capability to breach and hack that. Then you have people who are miscreants on a different level. You have people who could be hacking into hospitals, medical devices. Uh, energy grid hacking. There was just uh, a report dropped three days ago, I want to say, where over 100,000 ICS devices were just connected to the internet. And the, those create real incidents. I'm sure we all remember the colonial pipeline breach that caused mass panic, gas prices to spike. You're talking about giving normal people who might be a little upset on great power. So everything is just available to touch a keyboard. Cybersecurity weapons for everyone. Um, but honestly, much of the stuff is, much of the scary stuff is not really here today, like the sacred stuff. And no one can really predict the future. It's all in insecurity. But um, access and access to AI is a power that can be restricted with that censorship. Uh, and this is a waste way. But it's not. Here's stuff that I legitimately can't really show it right now. This is information regarding TCAPs, traffic collision and weight system. This is how airplanes detect other airplanes. Uh, it's an older system that's still very much used. Essentially, an okay, airplane you know how far away the airplane is and whether it should go up or down. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, there's a QR code here with a link to the paper that this is actually based off of. And one of the problems with this is that if you, read, and if you read this paper, you'll find out you can spoof it really easily. What happens when you spoof an airplane? You make these radar systems think that there's an airplane right in front of you. Or you can make a plane. You dramatically go up, dramatically go down. <coughs> you can make an airplane, you could overwhelm towers and completely run down traffic on the airport. You could fly what looks like a series of aircraft over restricted airspace. Imagine what the response would be. If, if somehow you could take this information and actually use an AI to build something like this and have what looks like spoof TCAS traffic flying over the White House. That would look a huge response. And it's not part of it, it's here. I actually have a lot of familiarity uh, in the area of this space. This works. This isn't something that took me an hour. This is something that took me 30 minutes and that every person can have access to within minutes. That's the thing. That's the scary part about this. And, you know, like I keep saying, today is the worst day out of the world. It will only get better. Before we have these sort of things, we need automate. And it's only a matter of time to until it becomes more accessible. I'm not saying the power of it. It doesn't need to get smarter. It just needs to become more accessible. Um, and I, I don't want to necessarily leave you in a sour note, but um, the biggest thing we need to do is push for fighting fire wire using AI to combat like, our enterprise systems, but also using AI to make sure that AI isn't outputting anything 